Welcome to another Sunday School lesson. This video presentation was created for those who cannot attend church today. Sunday School is a gift from God. Let's now learn the Word of God. The word giving is used in almost every sector of life. To most, it is an economic experience, because it costs to give. The process of giving turns the will of the economy. It involves a material, emotional, spiritual communication. No significant achievement is possible without the process of taking, giving and receiving ideas and materials to develop a technology. It is an exchange that is inherent across human societies and as such it is instrumental in maintaining social and business relationship. It is the ultimate way of expressing feeling. Without giving, both in words and actions, nobody will get what you need, desire, or wish to avoid. One area that is often neglected in church ministry is giving. Truth is it is something that every believer should do. Giving faithfully to God is a way of serving Christ and His church. However, the subject of money is a touchy one, especially when it involves the church. Other than the believer's willingness to give, there are other issues to hurdle. When there is no transparency, many disputes may arise from the collection and distribution of money than from any other church activity. To make matters worse, the news and entertainment media often give the idea that some ministers are greedy or financially dishonest. Today in our lesson, the Apostle Paul points out the positive side of giving, the positive side of generosity. He shared with the church in Corinth that there is joy that comes with giving, that there is joy in generosity. Jesus said in Acts 20:35, It is more blessed to give than to receive. The question is this, is that actually true? In our text Paul shared with us how we see joy in our giving. The background to our lesson is interesting. The church in Corinth had made a promise to give an offering to assist the Christians back in Israel. But the Corinthians had not followed through on their promise. Why? My guess is they were like many of us. It's a whole lot easier to talk about things than to actually perform it. It's easy to make big promises, but when it comes time to fulfilling those promises, it's easier just to skip over them. So Paul, instead of beating down the Corinthian church for not going through with their pledge to give, he inspired them. I really believe people are more motivated to give when they're inspired than when they're being guilt-driven. How did Paul inspire the Corinthians? That's just what we will learn today. A methodology to give to others, what we received as shareable blessings. In our first verse the Apostle Paul says but since you excel in everything. In faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in the love we have kindled in you. See that you also excel in this grace of giving. Even though the saints in Corinth had many problems, Paul declared that they still excel in everything. Citing the Macedonian example he motivated the Corinthian Christians to do as the Macedonians had done. The second reason given was that the Corinthian believers were spiritually gifted. First, they abounded in faith, which probably refers to both the faith they showed when they responded to the gospel message, and accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, as well as the faith they showed in daily living. Second, they abounded in speech. This can include their ability to preach and teach. Third, they abounded in knowledge, the understanding and application of spiritual truth. Fourth, they abounded in all diligence, or earnestness and eagerness. Fifth, Paul said they abounded in their love to us. This refers to the love that the Corinthian Christians had for Paul and his companions. Paul then said that they should also abound in this grace of giving. Giving is a spiritual gift, Romans 12 8, but sometimes it seems that this is one gift that some believers wish they didn't have. Many are falling short in that ministry. In verse 8, Paul says I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Paul had apostolic authority and could have used it to command that the Corinthian believers obey his instructions. However, when we remember that he was writing to some who questioned his authority, we can understand why he chose not to use his apostolic authority. 
the Apostle wanted his readers to give out of love for Christ and love for others. Instead of compelling the Corinthian believers to give, Paul chose to use the Macedonian believers as an example of giving in love. He refers to the time when the Macedonians gave diligently despite their circumstances. True love is demonstrated in deeds. If a person says he loves but doesn't do what he can to alleviate suffering, especially among God's people, there is reason to question that love. Paul was putting the Corinthians to the test. Paul continued to say in verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might become rich. The challenge the Apostle gave the Corinthians to resume their collection for the poor included the example of the Macedonian saints, as well as the Christian graces God had given them. But an even more important reason for giving was the example of love demonstrated by Christ. The Lord Jesus, who had been rich, incredibly rich, didn't let riches hinder showing his love for people. For the sake of humanity, Jesus became poor by setting aside his rights as God and becoming human. We know that Christ was deprived of a lot while he lived on earth. He was born in a stable. He had no place to call home, no place to lay his head. Jesus was poor because he embraced humanity, but he never stopped being God. He humbled himself and learned the cost of obedience. Paul told his readers that Jesus became poor so that we sinners, might become rich by receiving salvation and eternal life. When sinners exercise faith in him as Savior, they become rich. Christ gave himself for them, now they were to give to his needy people and his work. In verse 10 the Apostle said, And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give but also to have the desire to do so. Paul advised the Corinthian believers what they should do about the collection for the poor in Jerusalem. It appears that the Apostle was doing his best not to directly command the Corinthians about this matter. Paul believed that it was to the advantage of the Corinthians to resume the collection which they had started earlier. They needed to continue taking up the collection that they willingly begun to do a year earlier. They had stopped the collection effort for the poor saints in Jerusalem most likely because of questions about Paul's apostolic authority. Paul's advice was that they should pick up where they left off. They had shown the willingness to give, but now their willingness needed to be turned into action. Paul doesn't simply want them to give, but to desire to give. Desire primes the pump for giving. In verse 11, Paul continued to say now finish the work, so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it, according to your means. Paul encouraged these believers to complete the collection. Since they were willing, there also is the need to complete or finish taking up the collection out of that which ye have. This means that they were to give out of their abundance or from whatever they had. The Corinthians were better off financially than the believers in Macedonia, therefore they could give more. Paul's instructions here put the responsibility of giving above any legal amount or stipulation. It put the amount of the believers giving on a higher level that of grace. The Apostle went on to say in verse 12, For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. The important thing about giving is doing it with a willing mind. When eagerness and willingness to give is present, the gift is accepted by God. God does not hold a person responsible for what he does not have. Instead, each person is responsible before God for what he or she does have, which is the ability to give. God's blessing will accompany any gift given in the right spirit, whether it is large or small. God is pleased with what he sees in our hearts and he accepts that. We shouldn't, and we can't pledge to give what we don't have, thinking that God will supply what we don't have. That's putting God in a position that we aren't authorized to put him in, and he may not honor it. God wants believers to give generously, but not to the extent that those who depend on the givers, for example their families, must go without having their basic needs met. When deciding what to give, the tithe is a good place to start, but if you don't have 10%, but a willing heart to give, God will accept whatever you give. 
In verse 13 Paul says our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. The apostle wanted the Corinthian saints to know that in his request for them to give to the poor saints in Jerusalem, he didn't intend for them to be burdened, while other men, probably a reference to the poor in Jerusalem, were relieved of their poverty. In other words, Paul was saying to the Corinthians of course, I don't mean that those who receive your gifts should have an easy time at your expense. The point Paul seems to be making was that Christian giving must not encourage laziness on the part of those receiving the gift. The goal was not to make things easy for the Jerusalem church at the expense of the Corinthian believers. The goal was that all the churches would be equally provided for during difficult times. In verse 14 Paul says at the present time your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. When Paul said by an equality he was encouraging those who had much, in this case the Corinthians, to share with those who had unusually great needs, meaning those in Jerusalem. Equality is giving to relieve a need, not an artificial equalization of property. Paul's point was that if the Corinthian believers ever found themselves in need, other churches would share with them, then there would be equality in giving. It was quite possible that if the Corinthian believers helped the poor in Jerusalem, if they ever needed assistance then the believers in Jerusalem would be able to help them. This is the essence of equality in giving. The equality mentioned here may also be broader than this. It may refer to both spiritual and economic equality. As the Jerusalem Christians shared God's truth with the Corinthian believers, the Corinthians, in turn were to minister to the physical needs of the Jerusalem saints. The point here is that when a need is present, we should be willing to chip in and help fellow believers with what we have. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we should care deeply for one another. Our final verse says as it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. In this verse Paul used Exodus 16:17 to 18 to illustrate his point of equalization. In gathering manna, the person who gathered much, didn't have more than he needed. Likewise, the person who gathered little ended up having all that he needed. Whatever amount of manna the people gathered was enough to meet their daily needs. This should remind us that the Lord provides for us, and from what he provides, we should help meet the needs of those around us. Our key verse reads, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8 9 Jesus gave up a throne for a manger. Traded a crown for a cross. Laid down his life for strangers. So that the broken and lost will have eternal life. Christ gave himself for us, now we give to his needy people and his work. Let us hold fast to these principles in giving from 2 Corinthians 8. 1. Giving to God's work must not be neglected, verses 7 to 8. It is done to worship God, in conjunction to using our spiritual gifts. 2. Jesus Christ is the most outstanding example of sacrificial giving, verse 9. As children of Christ, we should be conscious of extending grace to others as we follow the example of Christ. 3. Even though a person may be willing to give, it is necessary to prove it by actually giving, verses 10-13. to And when we start a good work, we should finish the task with more fervor than when we started. 4. As in the case of the daily manna supplied in the wilderness, God's provision is always enough, verses 14 to 15. When God's way are followed by all, everyone's needs are met. Conclusion Christians are called upon by God to exercise the grace of giving. Paul used the Lord Jesus and the Christians in Macedonia as examples of giving. Giving should be done joyfully and lovingly. We should give out of an appreciation for all that the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. We should be willing to receive from God's people when we have a need, and we should be willing to give to others when they are in need. May the study of this lesson help us examine our level of giving. Remember, Christ gave his all for you.
the least we can do is give of what we have to help others. Thought to remember. Measured. God does not see the portion, but the proportion. Not my giving compared to my brethren. It should be regulated by my appreciation of his poverty that I might be rich. Generosity is a visible sign of an invisible grace. Generosity is not dependent on wealth. Generosity is based on choice, not ability. Generosity expresses itself out of a debt of grace. You will never be able to change unless you shift your thinking, from what you'll lose to what you'll gain. If we could give more but don't, God notes it. If we want to give more and can't, God also notes that. God sees the heart gift and not the hand gift. The world says, the more you take, the more you have. Christ says, the more you give, the more you are. Our lesson next week is entitled Loving and Just Behavior. Our biblical reference is Romans 12 9-21. We are truly glad you spent time to learn this week's lesson with us. We hope you are blessed with great things that strengthens your faith, and may you share these with somebody else. We wish you can join us at the Kubao Church of Christ soon. Our congregation is a place to discover faith, find new friends, grow closer relationship with Christ and serve with each other's gifts. Thank you very much, have a productive week, and God bless you always, dear brothers and sisters.